Yo, 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 welcome back, welcome back, my, yo, we did it, we are here, the 20th, 2020 controversial conversation, fire, I know, I know, still ain't, still ain't got it, still ain't got it, but it's all good, man, I am, I ain't gonna lie, I, I'm thrilled um, to actually be able to do this one, so, let's just, you know, a quick little backstory, so, Five months ago, I decided that it would be best if I, you know, addressed the uh, the country maybe like once a week, kind of talk about things that are going on, um, kind of jump started with the George Floyd situation. And speaking of the George Floyd situation, after that gruesome eight minute and forty six second snuff film, we we had a shift in the consciousness. You understand what I'm saying? Like there was this. There was this turning of the tide and people realized like, okay, this really is a problem. And a question was consistently asked, what, what can white people do? How can we be of assistance? How can we be allies? How can we educate ourselves to the perils and the struggles and the atrocities and tragedies that you are having to endure and suffer? And well, you know, I wanted to figure out the best way to address it, to talk about it, to explain it in multiple ways that that seem to really hammer the point down. So that's what this is today. The 20th Fireside Chat is a five part segment explaining in part in different areas of the United States and the way that the world operates, how white people can be allies what they can do to help the situation, and what they need to know. So without further ado, let's get off into part one. All right, so first and foremost, what I need you guys to do is I need you to educate yourself on two things. One is white supremacy, and the other is white privilege. Now, we're going to talk about both of them, but I want you to also take the time to really dive deep into what these mean surrounding your own personal life and your personal relationship in the way that you interact with different people of different colors and the different communities that you also interact with. Now, for me, the best way that I think that we can describe white supremacy is a unique set of standards, systems, structures, and settings created to dominate and instill thoughts of racial inferiority within any individual that doesn't represent the European model of whiteness. So what that really means is white in itself isn't necessarily a race. It's not, it can't be linked to a true ethnic identifier, right? So when we say white, we're talking about, you know, the Irish, the Italians, the Germans, the Scottish, the Welsh, and consistently going on with the European ancestral background. But what white supremacy does is it pits these type of individuals who have this type of background on a pedestal, which allows them certain benefits from society and the way that society treats them, the way that society interacts with them, and the way that their life goes on a day-to-day -day basis. And that part would be the white privilege. So white supremacy in itself is the mechanism that breeds and manifests white privilege. But I want to make a caveat on the privilege part. You see, it's not just white privilege. There's all kinds of privileges. I, as a male, have privilege because we live in a patriarchal type society. So I have an advantage as a male, but I have a disadvantage as a black male, right? So when we talk about able-bodied privilege, as you can see, you know, I'm not in a wheelchair, I'm not disabled. I have the ability to use my body to the best of my potential. That is a privilege, right? Light-skinned privilege, right? There is these types of things that people actually do benefit from. But in an entirety or totality, when it comes to white privilege, it dominates all other types of privilege. It allows white people to have the benefit of the doubt. It allows white people to feel like they are the default like anything other than white is not the norm, right? So everything else would be abnormal, which in turn 
breeds thoughts of inferiority into anybody who is not white. Because white supremacy is a psychological condition as well. So it is conditioned through all types of forms from the media, from books, from the way that politicians speak, from the way that history has unraveled itself. There's so many contributing factors. So if we were to kind of put it into a, a newer perspective or a more cultural perspective, right? I would say it like this. Um, if you're through, ah, my bad, y'all. If you're familiar with the uh, video game Madden, right? The NFL Madden. So you know that there's difficulty settings. So they start with rookie. What we would consider rookie mode or the easiest default setting would be the white man. The white man has all benefits in Western civilization, Western society, however you want to say it. He reigns supreme because that is the way that the game is set up. Okay. Now, next, we have the pro setting. This setting is reserved for white women because women do have disadvantages from the pay gap to the way that they're treated to sexual assault cases to all these other instances. I, I'm, I'm not a woman. I, I can't get deep, deep, deep into it. That's why I'm trying to get more females on the show or whatnot. But we would put their setting because they still benefit from all of the privilege that white people get and also extra added benefits of, you know, doubt with uh, social phenomenons like white girls tears and things like that. Um, so we would put their setting on pro, right? The next setting would be all pro. And this is what I would reserve for African-American males because we still have this semblance of, of privilege as a male, especially within the black community. The black male is consistently put above the black female in so many different orders and areas. And, and that's something that we have to address as well within our community, but that's not what we're talking about right now. So. I would give the black man the all pro rating. And when it comes to the most difficult setting, when it comes to operating in America, but also within the Madden NFL game system, it is the Hall of Fame setting. And that is what it appears the African American woman has to deal with on a day to day basis. And the strides that they make is nothing short than phenomenal and admirable. They are the most educated demographic in the United States. Like, I, I need y'all to understand what that means when you keep saying that education is what's gonna save things. Education is not what's gonna save things. Education helps, but when you're the most educated and you're still the most disenfranchised, then there's not really a true correlation. You dig it? All right, right, right. So, man, uh, yeah, like, yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, so white supremacy in itself is the systems it's the institutions. It's the way that society is crafted, okay? And then white privilege in itself is what's the benefits of the way that white supremacy dominates. So white supremacy isn't just necessarily the United States, even though it was built on an institution that kind of, you know, made it more of a... Uh, more of a white supremacist nation, you know, based on slavery and enslaving African Americans, based on what you believe to be their inferiority and stuff like that. But, you know, these motherfuckers did come from like England and shit, so I'm just saying, you know. Nah. But uh, it, it is also part of the actual European nations as well. So, like, like I say, educate yourself on understanding how white supremacy operates. Literally, every system, setting, structure, institution that is in America, figure out exactly how that they disenfranchise people and then also figure out how it is that you benefit from it. All right, so now that you're educating yourselves on, you know, supremacy and systems and mechanisms and whatever else I kept repeating to kind of get the point across, um, I'm, I'm going to leave in the uh, description a comprehensive list of black activists, educators, singers, writers, authors, all kinds of amazing, dope black excellence. So when you're educating yourselves, you're not going to the same old 
texts and the same old books and the same old recycled material that's already going to confirm your confirmation bias. You need to go read different sources and I'm going to give you a great list. So look out for that. But aside from that, let's move on y'all part two. So, um, yeah, this is, this is an interesting one. So I got a question for y'all. Do you know that there are three states, Wyoming, South Carolina, and Arkansas, Georgia was recently the fourth, that have no hate crime laws, right? No laws on hate crime statutes. Nothing at all. Like, it's 2020, and they don't have a damn thing. That's bad, and this is just as bad. There are also 17 other states that have no, rec uh, no requirement, my bad, for the collection of data on hate crimes. So even though they have hate crime laws, there's not really much data collection on it and there's really not much of a priority on it. So I'll read off those, those uh, states because some of those might be a little, a little surprising to y'all. So we got Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Colorado. That was an interesting one to me, right? Kansas, Missouri, Wisconsin, Ohio, West Virginia, Vermont, Bernie. Uh, New Hampshire, Delaware, Tennessee, North Carolina, Mississippi, of course, Alabama, of course, uh, Alaska, and then the territory of Puerto Rico. And I was just like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. But uh, yeah, this is something that I think if you're in these states, you need to push, push and push for stronger hate crime laws and then for stronger uh, data collection when it comes to these, from the DOJ to the state level to the local level, we really, really need a more comprehensive way of tracking hate crimes, hate assaults, all types of things that are perpetuated against each other just based on arbitrary identifying features, right? That is something that I think is definitely, definitely something that can help this racial conversation is, you know, an understanding that on a conscious level, it's wrong. Like, it's just wrong, no matter what you have to say about it, no matter who does it to who. If you are going against somebody just because of the color of their skin and you have this hatred in your heart, then you're wrong. And you should be punished, especially if you, do, not especially, but if you do something, you shouldn't just be punished for having racist thoughts. That's wrong. You know, you haven't committed a crime. But if you do commit a crime based off racial motives, then we have to have a you know, a nationwide set of standards and protocols that we follow to the T every time, okay? But regardless, that's where we are. Now, I decided to not just do this as hate crimes, but also hate crime laws and reparations. And I know, I know people are like, oh, I don't know about that, though. I don't know about that. And I feel you, I feel you, I feel you. But it is something that we definitely have to talk about. We've, we've spoken about it before. Um, we did last year whenever the, um, the HR 40 hearing was happening. Um, and it was a complete shit show, y'all. Just like all these other, you know, congressional hearings and stuff like that. It just, it doesn't really make too much sense. Like, it, it's political wrestling, like I always say. But regardless of that, I think we really, really need to talk about truly, truly talk about understanding what reparations is, what it can be, and why it is definitely necessary to pay up, right? <sighs> okay, so since we don't even have to use slavery, but seeing as slavery was the first institution that actually built this country, we have to use slavery, right? I mean, it has to start from slavery. I don't normally think we have to use slavery, even though it's all kinds of unpaid free labor, um, that really can't even be matriculated into an amount or a measurement, but we can use it as a lynch point as the descendants of slaves being, you know, or being the beneficiaries of whatever it might be. We'll get into that in a second. All right. So when black veterans came back from World War II, they didn't get the same GI Bill as their counterparts. They didn't get the same opportunities when it came to housing because there were things like redlining going on. Um, with the Homestead Act, prior to even that, you know, white families were given acres of land and home ownership and all types of things that would give them a leg up, which exacerbates the racial wealth 
gap that has consistently been spreading and spreading and spreading and spreading to the point that it's going to be very, very, very bad by 2053. Um, in comparison to where it's at right now, and that's what's really, really bad. Because when we think about stuff like the subprime mortgage crisis that decimated Black America wealth, we look at these types of things and we have to figure out like, okay, they've already been behind from the get-go, systemically placed in the back of the bus, right? Without a chance to do anything. And every time they make a step forward, I don't know, maybe Black Wall Street, we find ways of economic envy to bring them down. There has to be a way to pay reparations for these things. And it is time. Now, most people will who will agree with reparations will say, yes, I believe that the descendants of slave owners should have to pay a certain amount or a percentage or this, that, and the other, a transfer of some type of wealth to the descendants of the slaves that they owned. I'm with that. I get that. But it's got to be deeper than that. And that's where I think a lot of people have the issues. I personally believe that the government was the most complicit in the institution of slavery and the biggest beneficiary of slavery as it built up America into what it would become. So they allowed it. And if it wasn't for the government to emancipate it and eventually have, you know, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to basically, hopefully, keep it from happening, even though we know the 13th has the servitude clause where you can still be imprisoned and basically as a form of slavery, but regardless of all that. You know what I'm saying? So when we look at how we're going to approach reparations, it has to be a multifaceted type situation, and it also has to include, yes, the descendants of slave owners, but also government pro uh, programs or projects or something of that nature. Now, I actually have a few things that I think that we could do. Um, I think there could be a payroll exemption, you know what I'm saying, tax, or a payroll tax exemption for the descendants of slaves. I believe maybe a student loan forgiveness or a tuition-free college program for the descendants of slaves. Maybe instead of giving student loan debt, you could turn it into a thirty to $50,000 business loan or grant, you know, so we can start more small black-owned businesses. Um, or, you know, you could provide a, a certain amount of federal grants to uh, black recipients, maybe even some structured, you know, uh, uh, some settlements or whatnot, like uh, like the Indians. Got. I don't know. I'm not saying we got to have a new Africa or nothing like that. But what I am saying is there has to be conversations about this. And this is why I'm bringing it up right now. And along with the hate crime thing, because it is a severe issue that is not being addressed properly. And there's all kinds of estimates from $500 billion is what would be, how much it would be worth to $17 trillion. Um, I think a more accurate uh, estimation was, I believe, like $2.6 trillion based between the 30 million, um, roughly 30 million descendants of slaves would have been about $80,000 per person. Uh, you know, based off the 40 acres and a mule and adjusted for today's pricing and inflation and all that other kind of shit. So that is something I'd be like, oh shit, 80, 80 stacks? Shit, yeah. But I don't see that happening. So I think we do have to think about this in a more pragmatic way. And I think that some of the solutions that I have proposed would be a better, uh, a better way of going about that. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah, y'all knew it. Y'all knew it. You've watched the show enough to know that the police brutality and some type of solutions for these issues had to be addressed. Y'all knew I had to do it. So, fuck it. Let's get straight off into it because this is what we normally talk about. Um, yeah, the gross abuse... Nah, I'm just playing. You know, that's how I normally do it, right? Nah, what, what we've been attempting to do hasn't really been working in a lot of instances. And there's been a few solutions that have been proposed that have shown that they don't really work. And those are the ones that I want to talk about first. The first one would be giving them more money. Now, I don't really understand when they have such an already bloated budget, why giving them more money 
is the answer. Like nobody can really explain it other than they have a dangerous job. We've already talked about that. It's not even really in the top fifteen. And they're like, well, they have to do this. I'm like, that's fine. But if we defunded, you know, the police officers' jobs where we could actually allocate resources and not have their job as hard, then they don't have to. You know, it's like th th there's no real argument. So regardless of that one, um, community representation. You see, I don't really care too much what the police officers are looking like anymore because the culture in itself, the culture of the police departments is just so rotted and, you know, just sickening and disgusting and just immoral that it doesn't really matter who you bring in. You have to system yeah, systematically change these departments, their protocols, and everything, the way that they operate by cleaning house. And I don't see you doing that, so I don't see this being a viable solution. Body cams, the way that they conveniently fall off whenever there's about to be something happening. Now, if we were to turn that into a, a crime against police officers, eh, it's not going to happen. So there's always the loophole also like, well, we can't even keep them charged all the time. So, you know, it's like convenient that they end up dying right before somebody else ends up dying, right? So body cams don't help. I'm not saying they don't need to, but they need a better system, and that is not a solution. Um, banning the use of excessive force, like strangleholds and chokeholds and knees on the neck, and you already think about people who have died based off of those instances. So it's like, yeah, that, that works really, really well. Because in these places, they had these these bans on these you know excessive forces, and it still happened. So this isn't a solution. This is a, a sweeping under the rug, I guess you would say. And then updated training methods. I know that's a broad way of saying it, but racial sensitivity training when it comes to actual police officers and policing doesn't really do anything trying to train them in de-escalation hasn't really helped so the methods that we're attempting to train them in um it doesn't really work i think if we're going to talk about training that we need to extend their training you know what i'm saying to include a lot more than just whatever they do at the academy and then here's a gun there you go i'm sure it's a little bit more complex or nuanced than that but it doesn't seem like it because they seem like they're very untrained in the heat of the moment so that's about five uh solutions that are normally pushed that i just don't see actually working but i do have five for you that i think will and we're gonna go through these kind of quick so the first one is to end broken window policing and this is when i say the over criminalizing of certain things like homelessness like poverty really like drug abuse like mental health crisis like noise ordinances you know disturbing the peace things like that that's can that can still end up leading to a tragic event like a tailpipe leading to somebody losing their lives a phone call about a mental health crisis leading to somebody losing their lives a phone call about a child in the park playing with a BB gun losing his life, right? The over-criminalizing of minor things, not even offenses, but just literally criminalizing things to do it, right? So by ending that, you know, by not having police officers respond to all of these small type of infractions and then also by creating departments that can respond to them like mental health facilities or social workers or other types of things that would better be apt to deal with the circumstances and the situations rather than a police officer with a gun. So ending broken window policing would be a, uh, a solution that I have. Community oversight and a civilian review board is number four. Um, and basically, you, you create these, a complaints office, and you also create a police commission board that's completely civilian, right? It's completely members of community organized uh, organizations will come together and they will vote on the people that will be placed in these positions from the community that will, um, that will be doing investigations, that will be able to discipline, to dismiss police officers when they do the things they're not supposed to, which is normally just held uh, for the police chief. It will also allow them to choose the police chief based off of recommendations from the community. 
And then when we have, like I said, investigations, it's not going to be the internal investigations that police officers and police departments are allowed to conduct upon themselves. We will also be able to have civilian review boards that can also be uh, investigated with all of the same material, with all the same data, with all the same evidence given to them in a lengthy time frame. Lengthy? In a certain amount of time, you know what I'm saying? Without going over like 24 to 48 hours when it comes to body cams or, you know, those kind of things. Um, all information, all evidence, all data, everything must be given to the uh, review board so they can use the exact same information to make a determination as the police department would make or is going to make. And that would be something I think is really, really pivotal. And that's something that we should be able to instill into all local communities. Uh, third... Police union fair contracts. Um, so this basically addresses barriers to effective investigations, kind of like I was speaking about earlier. Um, it's it's hard, right? Um, there's the way that the police unions are set up are set up basically like all unions to protect the people. So even if the police officers are doing things that would be deemed hell unconstitutional, uncivil, brutal. Uh, abuse, whatever you would want to say, that the police use the police union is still going to step in to protect their own. You know that thin blue line, and we need to have more fair police contracts. Uh, so in D.C., they removed the wording that says all matters pertaining to the discipline of law enforcement officers, because it's basically a blanket statement, and that effectively makes it able to have police accountability to a degree. So, I believe um, police union fair contracts, number three. Uh, number two, demilitarization, ending what they call a federal government 1033 program, which is where the federal government has been shooting military-grade weapons and shit, armored vehicles, tactical gear, tear gas, all kinds of shit to these police departments, bulking them up and making them more like a military rather than police officers, right? So we need to end that contract, for one. And then also, um, there's uh, there's talks about looking into the police departments themselves, the ones that use excessive force, the ones that use this tactical gear or this type of stuff, you know, um, on a regular or use it authoritatively, might not be the way to say it, but y'all know where I'm going with that, um, that they would have to also return it. Um, I think we should go ahead and decommission these armored vehicles. There's no real reason that we should have these things riding on the street. You know what I'm saying? It's really just intimidation factors. Um, so, yeah, demilitarizing. And then also with the tactics. Like, there's no reason that you should be coming out here to, you know, to use these uh, military-style tactics to disperse crowds who are, for, you know, just using their First Amendment rights. Um, and then the last thing would be also to establish... This is still demilitarizing. Uh, to establish almost like the military has with the Geneva Convention or laws of engagement, rules of engagement, where you literally cannot shoot at an individual that you know you are not being threatened by, especially unarmed individuals, until you have been threatened, until there is a threat, a true threat. You cannot shoot, and it happens overseas all the time, and it's something that we could do because they're actually in a war zone, and we are literally on domestic soil so it just doesn't doesn't add up but whatever um, and the last thing that we really have to do and it's the most important thing and we really can't do too much until we actually address this one and that is to end qualified immunity y'all have heard about this it was a 1982 uh, Supreme Court uh, decision that basically says uh, oh well it protects government officials from you know violating your civil rights so you technically can't sue, right? And police officers are included within, within this, so you can't actually sue them unless what they have done has precedent. But even if it has precedent, if it doesn't have precedent in the jurisdiction it happens, then it still doesn't matter. So it's damn near, if not impossible, to get police accountability, to sue for wrongful deaths and for civil suits and things like that, and it doesn't make sense because if we have things like malpractice for doctors who can be sued when it seems like they were, you know, negligent or they fucked up, then we should have the same thing for police officers, especially if we're talking about police accountability. 
Um, and there's obviously more methods like ending for profit, pri- uh, well, yeah, prisoning, but for profit policing, um, like you know, where they try to get quotas for speeding tickets and stuff like that at the end of the uh, end of the year. And when y'all be like riding around, like, oh, shit, they out, boy, they out, yeah, stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do, but I think these five things that I just proposed are a great way to start it, and then we can continue building upon that. <sighs> Alright, so um, this one right here, it might actually be probably the most important um, out of all of these segments, and it has to deal with authority figures and their interactions with I guess you could say subordinates, whether it be black employees, whether it be black students, just the interactions that they have and the way that they conduct themselves, I think needs to be addressed. Because workplace discrimination and school discrimination really are things that aren't spoken about too much. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, highlight both and we're gonna start with workplace discrimination. So how many of you have heard of a term called racial battle fatigue? What it basically explains is that there is elevated levels of exhaustion, anxiety, depression, and other types of negative connotations, basically, that are associated with African Americans in professional settings due to the extra standards and things that are placed upon them. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I've dealt with it. I've called it out. And to no avail, nothing has happened, right? So I can give examples. Um, Say you're on a production line, right? And you have two machines that are supposed to do the exact same job. You have two people who are supposed to do the exact same job who are listed under the exact same job title, correct? All right. One of them is black. One of them is white. The black person might have been there for maybe three and a half years and has excelled at everything they have been asked to do. They've exceeded at becoming the most efficient person on this machine, right? And the level of production that they are able to do on a daily basis far exceeds anybody else. Okay. Then you have a white counterpart who has been here, let's say, maybe about seven years, um is very, very inefficient, is very, very slow, and is very, very unproductive. They have the exact same job, same title, and same machine. Now, what's gonna happen normally is that since this black co- or this black worker is able to do more, they're gonna be forced to do more. And they're not gonna get the credit for it. They're not gonna get the compensation for it. Now, I know you're thinking, this is normal, but see, this is gonna happen to a point that is so blatant that the white coworker is literally going to be free throughout the day to do less while the black coworker is taking their work, doing more and more of their work because they can do it. And it happens in so many different instances. That's just something I've been able to see. Um, The way that standards are placed upon black employees with certain rules and conduct that isn't placed on white employees. We could talk about hair. Yes, I love it. I love my hair. I don't care what y'all say. It's like beautiful, right? You dig? But in most professional settings, this would be considered unprofessional hairstyle. What would be considered professional? Well, you already know. Straight hair, a little shortcut, this, that, and the other. Things that can represent the European standard of beauty. So when this comes to African-American women, and you know, I'll be doing y'all hair. I I know. I love it. I love it. You know, it's, it's... It's a tradition. It's a traditional, uh, beautiful cultural experience to be able to do your hair in the ways that we're able to do it. But we can't do that at work. We can't actually represent our true selves. And we have to do things that actually hurt ourselves. So there's studies that show that the chemicals, like the lye and the dye, that are put in perms and straighteners and things like that, that black women have to use to make their hair straight to be professional setting actually has led to higher cases of birth or uh, breast cancer, right? So we're literally killing ourselves just to work in your setting because you don't understand that our hair is just as natural as yours. So those type of situations cause undue levels of stress, of depression, of anxiety, 
and they cause racial battle fatigue, the over-exhaustion of feeling like you have to work twice as hard to get half as much. So that is certain things that happen in the workplace. And I know that if you go to work and you just watch, just watch the micromanaging of white uh, supervisors and managers when it comes to black employees and the way that they treat them. Just watch and you'll see that there's, there's just different dimensions to the way that other people get treated. And then real quick, also when it comes to school. Now the way that uh, black children are policed in school is nothing short of despicable. For the same infractions that white counterparts will do, they might get sent to the office when the white counterpart might get a warning. They might get sent to ISS when the white counterpart might get detention, right? So things like that, they, they have harsher punishments for the same infractions, which kind of reminds us of the way that the justice system actually works. And it's funny because there's this thing called school to prison pipeline, which is basically recycling black children from school by giving them harsher punishments, kicking them out of school, and then forcing them, you know, into certain instances and situations that make them do things that they normally wouldn't do. And what we call that is self-fulfilling prophecy. When you believe this person ain't shit, they ain't never gonna be shit, they daddy ain't shit, they mama ain't shit, they family ain't shit, so that's what they, they gonna be, ain't shit, that internalizes within them to believe that they ain't shit and it makes them do ain't shit ass things, all right? I'm just being 100% honest with you. So when we think about the way that black children are, are, uh, are policed at schools, that is an issue that we have to address. The way that they're taught in schools, the way that they're treated in schools, and the way that the interactions between them and authority figures like principals and security guards, those type of interactions need to be addressed in a way that we can find more conducive ways to presenting a more mentally balanced work environment, school environment for the black children, all right? That, that's the best way that I can say it. So as an authority figure, I just want you as, uh, you know, hip hop said, I need you to check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? Because there's a lot of damage that you are doing to the psyche of black children and also to the psyche of black workers. All right, y'all, here we are. Part five. I know, I know. Y'all had me like, yes, we made it. We made it. <laughs> but on some real shit, though, I, I hope that this has been informative. I hope it has been educational. I hope it's been enlightening. I hope that it has shown you that there are solutions and there are things that you can do that can help these situations. So if you're looking for things that you can do on like a daily basis or everyday thing or just, you know, to help you be more conscious of the fact that you need to be more conscious of the fact. Um, here's just a few things. Uh, have those tough conversations with your family members and with your friends. You got to call things out. I don't. Obviously, the most you know, uh, the most obvious example would be like you know calling out your old granddaddy at Thanksgiving and stuff like that. But it's it's more simple than that. Like calling out your friend whenever they say that joke that you no just isn't right it's just uncomfortable it's just like all right man I, I get it things can be funny but you know like what was your intention with that you know like make people feel uncomfortable about being racist make them feel as stupid as they are right okay <sighs> bring awareness to black issues and black causes right get involved with the things that are going on not just the protests but actual organizations that are built built on the foundation of bettering life for African Americans in this diaspora or as we call it, the United States so you can do that you can also donate to these organizations you can spend money at black owned businesses and you can also put money into black owned banks which will in turn help black Americans get better rates on loans, get better grants for starting businesses, so you can actually help the black community thrive by donating to these types of situations and these types of institutions. You can fight, as we just talked about, for workplace equality. Yes, fight for it. Fight for pay gaps, you know what I'm saying? Like, we always talk about 
you know, the black and white pay gap, which is fucked up. Don't get me wrong. But then let's talk about the black and white female pay gap. Because, you know, even within the the uh, pay gap when it comes to females, black females are paid even less than white females. So let's even talk about that. You know what I'm saying? Bring awareness to these situations so that people can start getting paid properly. So people can start getting paid what they're, you know, what they've earned. Um, you got to stop telling black people how they feel. Listen. Listen to their experiences. Listen to what they are telling you, okay? You can have questions, you know what I'm saying? You could try to figure out why things happened and stuff like that, but don't antagonize. You don't always have to play devil's advocate, especially when they're confiding in you and they're at a state of vulnerability and they're telling you something that literally traumatized them or has added to the extra levels of stress that they endure on a daily basis. Listen to black people. Hear black people. Advocate for change in your community. That, that could be something as small as going to the police department to find out the demographic of how many low-level offenders are in prison or in you know the jail system for bullshit crimes, and then start advocating for them. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, why someone so locked up, bro? Let my mans out. You know what I'm saying? Start campaigns about freeing these type of low-level offenders. You can do it for white folks, too. But I'm just saying, if you want to do it for black people in your community, because they are traditionally um, and historically targeted when it comes to this war on drugs, it'd be great to have more allies advocating for them to get out, especially the low-level offenders. Um, and then this, this last one. I can't stress this one enough. You need to recondition yourself to not see black as a threat, but to see black as beautiful because that's what black is. <sighs> the rhythm that you guys are able to vibe to that black people provide you got to also be able to listen to the blues that are coming from them as well. You got to understand that if you are going to be a part of the cultures that black people have created, then you must also pay homage to the pioneers that have paved those ways. You can't jump into these industries and expect to be treated a certain way when you don't understand how that game is played. You know, you got to really truthfully change the way that you view the world. You have been conditioned to see black people as a threat, to see them as an enemy, to see them as lower, to see them as non-human. And you have to change this. You have to consciously program yourself on a day-to-day -day basis and allow yourself to let go of your preconceived biases of what black people are. You have to stop letting the news condition you into believing that they are villains and thugs and criminals. You have to take the time to educate yourself to see what they have contributed, what has been stolen from them, and how they are really treated in this country. So that is the number one thing that you have to do when asking what can white people do, you must recondition your mind to not see black as negative or as a threat and to help celebrate the beautiful blackness. Thank you. I'll see you next week.